you're going to have to get that encoder on here. That stuff ain't going to get recorded, I tell you that. He say, don't hearken to those dreams. Hold on. I wish these men dream. Because these dreams in your own heart will deceive you. And it's what he telling you. He telling you, I ain't sent these people. Don't even hearken to the stuff that's coming out your own mind. Because it might have been untripped you up. Swing on over here to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Second Timothy 4 and 1. I charge thee therefore before Elohim and the master Yahushua HaMashiach, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. I'm going to just swing over here to Ezekiel chapter 2 so you can see where, this get, where he get this from. Because this man said you got to preach the word and you need to be instant. Let's pull that Greek word for that real fast. Why you swinging over there to Ezekiel chapter 2? He said you need to be instant, in season and out of season. You got to preach the word. The word got to be moved. See, it don't matter if the people want to hear it or not. But this Greek word for be instant is the, st the place, to place over, to stand over one, to place oneself above, or to be ready. Or the time to come upon. Basically take your stand. You got to stand on the word and you got to let it be and you got to let it go. And when he telling you in season is just that when the opportunity occurs or conveniently. Because I just was telling Will that as before for like dealing with my daddy. He say in season, out of season, even when the opportunity don't doesn't necessarily present itself. Cause sometimes you can't always just drop the word on people. When you talk about an individual, you opportunity has to present itself. One of the biggest mistakes sometimes people make is they try to hit people with the word. At the wrong time. If you hit them with it at the wrong time, chances are they're not going to accept it. But swing over here to Ezekiel chapter 2. Because he told you to preach the word in season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. You know, long suffering is a. Uh, let me pull that word for you in the Greek, man. We still there. We still here. Long suffering is a very, very vital attribute to possess that's patient endurance and forbearance and slowness in avenging wrongs you know what I'm saying one of probably the most difficult things for anybody to do is to be patient when somebody is doing you wrong Ezekiel chapter 2 you know y'all was very long suffering towards us when we were doing him wrong by sin and this ain't the first time I done told y'all this so therefore, you have to be able to reciprocate that back to others when they're doing you wrong. And you're going to see a bit of that when we swing to what I got for you and Job a little bit. Job chapter 2, verse 4. Verse 3, well, verse 1, actually. And he said unto me, Son of man, stand upon thy feet, and I will speak unto thee. And the Ruach entered into me when he spake unto me. And he sat me upon my feet, that I heard him that spake unto me. And he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Yasharal, to a rebellious nation that have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me, even unto this very day. For they are impudent children and stiff-hearted, and I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith Yahuwah Elohim, and they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall they know then, shall know that there have been a prophet among them. And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dwell among scorpions, be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. And thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they forbear, for they are most rebellious. He tell them to preach the word in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Because he already telling them that they're rebellious and that they're not going to listen. See, hold on though. Let's come back to 2 Timothy chapter 4 and then we swing to Ezekiel 33 to back up what he's going to tell him. Hold on one second. Should have did this first off. Alrighty then. So let's look at verse 3. He said, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou at all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. So 
We'll look at that there when he tell you to make full proof. Full proof. Even though that ain't the necessary thing when I came over here for. But I just read that because that's something I got. Probably had looked at a while back because I got it marked. That means that's something I was looking at. It's, it's to be persuaded or fully convinced or assured. Or to feel one with any thought, conviction, or inclination. To carry through to the end, accomplish. To fulfill the ministry in every part. To cause a thing to be shown to full. To make full. So when he's telling you to do this here, that means to make full proof that the Most High has sent him. And that he finishes the work. And by product of his service, it would bear witness that Yahuwah has sent him. Is what Paul is instructing him. But we're looking at verse 3 though. I just read it out. Because it says, you know, verse 6. For I'm not ready to be offered at the time of my departure is at hand. Yeah, verses 5 and 6 is something I have prepared. Who knows what I was thinking about when I looked at it at the time. Most high willing, we'll, we'll revisit it. But he said, they'll heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And their hearts are turned after fables. And that goes to what we were just reading in Jeremiah 29. About... Don't hearken to the dreams because I, he hasn't sent them, nor the dreams that you have caused yourself to dream, because you may deceive yourself through the own wicked imaginations and machinations of your own mind, because the mind always wants to incline itself to go after what it wants. Therefore, you can perceive something. See, I'm going to show you something. Isaiah 66, and then we come right back to Matthew 24. And, it, and, and your mind and heart can take you away from what this man actually wants you to go. And this is the reason why. Isaiah 66 and 3. He said, He that kill an ox as if he slew a man. He that sacrificed a lamb as if he cut off a dog's neck. He that offered an oblation as if he offered swine's blood. He that burned incense as if he baruched an idol. Yea, they have chosen their own ways and their soul delight in their abominations. I will also choose their delusions and will bring their fears upon them. Because when I called... None did answer, and when I spake, they did not hear. But they did evil before my eyes, and chose that in which I delighted not. So that's the whole key thing when he sit back and he say he's chosen your ways because your soul delights and your abomination. He'll cause you to turn to fables away from the truth, and we know the tr the truth is Hamashiach. Now we know that in Isaiah, he told you that this man could be a stumbling and a rock of offense to both houses of Yashorah in Jerusalem. So. As he told you in Psalm 69, that which would be for you. Let me, let me show you that. Psalm 69. Just let me show you that. Matter of fact, make it Romans 11. And then we come back to Matthew 24. Make sure that's what it might be. Romans 10. Romans 9. No, I can't recall. Go ahead, it's Psalm 69. It make no difference. I had this one spoke about me once. So, I even though that, that wasn't necessarily the case, it, it is definitely can be true, most definitely. And we've mentioned it as forth as other things. Let's look at Psalm 69 and uh, 19. Psalm 69 and 19. Psalm 69 and 19. All right, then. Thou hast known my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. My adversaries are all before me. Matter of fact, go on here and just uh, make that by verse 14. Or make it by verse 12. Matter of fact, Miss Make It Eleven. I made sackcloth also my garment, and I became a proverb to them. They that sit in the gate speak against me, and I was the song of the drunkards. But as for me, my prayer is unto thee, O you who are an acceptable time, O Elohim, and the multitude of thy mercy hear me in the truth of thy salvation. Deliver me out of the mire, and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from them that hate me, and out of the deep waters. Let not the water flood overflow me, neither let the deep swallow me up. And let not the pit shut her mouth upon me. Now, this is a prayer, a psalm of David. And he's speaking on how his enemies are after them. And those that hate him seek to destroy him. And he's praying that Yah will save him through the truth of his salvation. When we look at the truth of his salvation. And I don't want to go too, too far off topic. It's dirty, dirty dog. 
Okay, there we go. Now we're back at it. And again, it's your it's your iman, and it's your firmness, your true doctrine, your testimony. Though know, this is a mashat, both ways, the truth of his salvation. And the knowledge of when you when you sit back and he says, Hear me in the truth of thy salvation or the your shot. I want you to hold this here. I want you to come over here to first John chapter three. Seeing you cry out to this man in the truth of his salvation, this is how you're gonna be able to be heard, to be able to be delivered. But it has to be in the truth or the firmness or faithfulness of his salvation. Because I'm gonna be honest with you, a lot of people say they believe, but of course, you know, we've been talking about that a lot. A lot of people don't believe as they claim, because it's a lot of doubts that rest in the hearts of men. And these doubts is what hinders men and trips them up continually. First John chapter three, verse twenty-two. But we'll make it about verse 20. We'll make it verse 18. First John 3 and 18. He said, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So he's telling us this is the test of our faith right here. He's saying, let us, let us not love in word, neither in with our mouths. Because he, see, he told you in Psalms and he told you in Isaiah that this people with their mouth show much love. And we still got to swing to Ezekiel 33. He said, but their hearts are far from me. Because they hard go after the covenants, or they weren't steadfast in their covenant. Since I mentioned that Ezekiel 33, and he brought it back to mind when we needed to hit it. Let's swing around that Ezekiel 33. Then we come right back to 1 John. Forgive me if I'm moving too fast. Just let me know if I'm going a little too fast. I'll try to slow it down a little bit. 33 and uh, 30. Ezekiel 33 and 30. Ezekiel 33 and 30. He says, I take heed that no man deceives you. Because there are many deceivers and vain talkers, especially they of the circumcision, who are not entering, seeking to enter into the kingdom of Shamahim, nor are they seeking to allow others to enter in. He says, also, thou son of man, the children of thy people are still talking against thee by the walls and in the doors of the houses, and speak one to another, every one to his brother, saying, come, I pray you, hear the word. Hear what is the word that come forth from Yahuwah. It's the same different like they did to Moses. We did talk about that on the Sabbath. They were sitting around in the houses talking against him. Yet they still talking about let's come hear the word. But let's look what he said after that. And they come unto thee as the people come. And they sit before thee as my people. And they hear thy words. But they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love. But their heart go after their covetousness. And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that have a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear thy words, but they do them not. And when this come to pass, and lo, it will come. Then they shall know that a prophet hath been among them. You know, a brother told me, dear brother, oh man, you know, uh, he was running across that frustration that, you know, he's out here, he, he's preaching the word, and he had started to run across that people didn't have a love and desire for the word as he had, and it was frustrating him. This is one of the reasons why Yah warned Ezekiel and told Ezekiel what he told him, that this is a rebellious house, and they're not going to hear you because they don't hear me. The same thing that we see in Isaiah, and it's the same thing he's saying again in Ezekiel, that they're coming to sit down. See, this is where you sit back and look at it at what an instance of, Ezekiel is a high priest. He's a priest. He's a prophet. These people know he's a priest, so he taught in the law. And he's a prophet. He's prophesying. This is how Hamashiach slide in in the same token. A priest and a prophet. You know what I'm saying? So, people assume, oh, if you got the word, then everybody going to do right. But then you see him telling Ezekiel that the people are going to come to you as my people come. And they're going to hear your words, but they're not going to do them because the people's hearts are inclined unto their lust. That's why he said they have, they're have they going to heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, having people who will tell them things that will incline to their lust and their desires so they may accomplish the things that they desire to do and not truly serve Yahuwah and Ruach and in truth. This is why he said, let us not love in word and in tongue, because that's what the people were doing. And that's what we're doing now. He said, but in deed and in truth, that means in faith and in action. That means faith without works is dead. If you believe in this man, then the just shall live by their faith. You will execute and show forth your faith by how you live. This is why he would tell Timothy, make full proof of your ministry. Your ministry is not inclined just on what you preach, but how you live. And this was always the problem with Yasharal. We showed much love with our mouths, but our hearts were never with the man. We were never steadfast in the covenant. 
We were never firm. We were never unmovable, unshakable. You know, as it says in Hebrews, those things that are not shaken remain. We got to be able to remain. Come on back to 1 John chapter 3. 3 and 18. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before them. So when we know our hearts can be assured when we show forth that we're of the faith. So you got to move past thinking about at least so you think about the Hebrew word for truth and move past thinking that's just law. It's about faith. It's your firmness. You will assure that you are of the faith, which means you will assure yourself that you are of his members that were written. Before uh, that were the members that were written in the book before they ever existed or those who were ordained to salvation from the foundation of the world. Comfort and assure yourself by how you live by product of the righteous obedience of faith to show forth that you are of him and that you may please him. For if our heart condemn us, Elohim is greater than our heart and know all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence towards Elohim. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son, Yahushua HaMashiach, and love one another as he gave us commandment. He that keep his commandments and dwell in him, and he in him, hereby we know that he abide in us and the Ruach, which he have given us. So when we come back to Psalm 69, now we can see how we can be heard in the multitude of his mercies and the truth of his salvation. This is why Hamashiach was heard. He was heard and that he feared because he abided in the multitude of the mercies of the Father and the truth of his salvation. He trusted in the Father and therefore the Father delivered him and executed that salvation on, on his behalf. We're in uh, Psalm 69 and uh, verse 16. It says, Hear me, O Yahuwah, for thy loving kindness is good. Turn unto me according to the multitude of thy mercies. Hide not thy face from thy servant, for I am in trouble. Hear me speedily. Draw nigh unto my soul and redeem it. Deliver me because of my enemies. Thou hast known my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. My adversaries are all before thee. Reproach have broken my heart and I'm full of heaviness and I look for some to take pity. But there was none and for comforters, but I found none. They gave me also gall for my meat and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Let their table become a snare before them and that which should have been for their welfare, let it become a trap. He said that which should have been for their welfare. Let it become a trap. Let's look at that word welfare. And let's see what we come up with. And that word is simply shalom. That which should have been for their health, their prosperity, their peace, their tranquility, their con contentment, or the destruction of the authority attached to chaos. He said let that, let Hamashiach, let their rest, let that be a trap. Now, how can the same man who is meant to save become a trap? We have to see that. Be patient with me, and, and, and maybe we can accomplish that. Let's come back over here to Matthew 24. This is why this man is telling you don't let nobody deceive you, because what's supposed to be for your good can end up being for your destruction if you are not careful. Verse 5 of Matthew chapter 24. He said, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am a Shiach, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and hate one another. Now, of course, he's dealing with the last day. But we're going to deal with how many people will become offended and betray men to be killed. This is what the same token where you're going to see that that which was to be for your welfare is going to end up becoming a trap for many. So before we begin to slide into that, and let me grab this word for trap real quick. And that word is... Uh, Mokashe, and it's simply just a snare. So since I mentioned it being a snare, let's read Isaiah chapter 8. Let's read that, and then we'll swing to Job chapter 8. Yeah. Isaiah 8 and 11. Make it 9. 
It says, Associate yourselves, O ye people, and ye shall be broken pieces. Give ear, all ye far countries, and gird yourselves, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Gird yourselves, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Take counsel together, and it shall come to naught. Speak the word, and it shall not stand, for Allah is with us. For Yahuwah spake thus to me with a strong hand, and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, you're going to have to sit back and, and, and be able to understand this. That this people is very carnal and they're not steadfast. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have a heart, but they can't understand and perceive lest they should be converted and Yahuwah should heal them. So because of this, their hearts are made hardened and that which was for their benefit ends up becoming a trap. See how it ends up becoming a trap one or two ways. It becomes a trap because, and now let me phrase this properly, because you heard of Yahushua HaMashiach and rejected him, or you heard of him and continued to walk in iniquity. Let's matter of fact, let's look at the aspect of hearing of him, but continue to follow your, follow your vain imagination. Matthew 7 and 15. Matter of fact, let's make it 7 and 20, because we short for time to be reading all that extra stuff. We're just going to get straight to the point. Matthew 7 and 20. We'll make it 18 though. It says a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. It's just as simple as that. We look at it all the time. You say it all the time. You've read it all the time. But if you are good and what is good. Well, let hold on. Let's look and see. Pause. Romans 7. Let's see what is good. Let's look at Romans 7. Let's see what is good. But this ain't just no Hebrew Israelite understanding of what is good. You know, we're a little sharper than that, a little better than that. Where is it? What's that? Right there. Romans 7 and uh, 12. Romans 7 and 12. He said, Wherefore, the Torah is Kadash, and the commandment Kadash, just and good. Now, we just sat back and looked at what the commandment is. The commandment is to believe on his son. He said that is good. Now, remember, now we're looking here in Isaiah 8. He said that he told you. That you should not walk in the way of this people say, my bad, I'm in Matthew 7. Where you say, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. So, when we sit back and we look at this, let's look at something, right? The master said in and, and, and Matthew 19 that there was no man good upon the earth when he said good master. Yet we know that he is that good tree and he brought forth good fruit. We know what that fruit was. Let's look at the fruit of which he brought and see how this man can end up being a trap and a snare. Because you know in Acts chapter 10 it says he went about doing good. So let's swing down here to Galatians chapter 5 and let's see the manifestation of the fruit. Because we know that it's, except the corner we fall on the ground and die to bite alone. But if it died, bring forth much fruit. So we knowing that this good tree can only manifest good fruit. The only way it can manifest good fruit is that one has to die. Now we, what we're leading into is a statement that the master is about to make in Matthew chapter 7 to see how that which is for your welfare can be a trap because you can, you can hear of Mashiach and then he'd be a trap to you. He'd be a snare to you because he's a snare to some because they heard of him and rejected him and he's going to be a snare to others because they heard of him and then like he said in Luke 6 and 46, why do you call me master and you don't do the things that I say? Nevertheless, Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 but the fruit of the Ruach is love so we know the first thing a uh, manifestation of that fruit is love love to who? love Elohim with all your heart all your strength and all your soul and your neighbor as yourself because there's no way you can love your neighbor if you don't love Yahuwah if you can openly flaunt if, and, and wantonly and flaunt disobedience in this man's face I know that there's no way that you can love another individual and if you can't love an, another individual I know that you don't love Yahuwah See, because he know that he says that on the prophets that 
do unto others as you would want done unto you, legs hang all the Torah and the prophets. Because love work no ill to his neighbor. You're not going to lie on your neighbor. You're not going to sleep with your neighbor's wife. You're not going to covet nothing your neighbor has. You're not going to envy your neighbor. You're not going to be jealous of your neighbor. You're not going to kill your neighbor. You're not going to do any of that. See, love is not an emotive word. It's an action. It's an action of uprightness and justness that you wouldn't do to anyone that you would not want rendered unto you. And if you can do things to someone that you wouldn't want anyone to render unto you, then the love of Elohim is not in you. And that goes back to what we were looking at in 1 John chapter 3 of not loving in word and, 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 and tongue, but in deed and in truth. And this is what stumbles many and will cause Hamashiach to be a snare and a trap, though individuals profess to have faith in him. See, we can't look at the individuals who say they don't believe in a Mashiach, but then don't manifest the actions and fruits and byproduct of the man whom we profess to believe, because in actuality and truth, we would be in the same boat as those who have rejected him outright. Then he says joy. You know, you know joy is hard for some people. He said, you know, pain endure for a night, but joy come in the morning. Hamashiach had joy, even though he faced the stake. We dealt with that before. He endured the stake. Set, looking at the joy that was set before him Some people can't re re rejoice And have joy in their heart When they're persecuted for righteousness sake When their name is cast as evil For Yahusha's name's sake When people separate themselves from your company For Yahusha's name's sake Or when they're brought down low Or when they're suffering Or when they're afflicted All they do is complain and whine Like your forefathers did in the wilderness He says shalom So now we just looked at this that which is for your welfare is shalom. He said, let that shalom, let that destruction of the authority attached to chaos, let that be a trap for you. Look what he said in Psalm 69. This goes back when the master said, if I wouldn't have came and did the work that no other man did, they would have not had sin. But since I have came, they have no cloak for their sin. So that which became for their welfare actually became a trap to them because he came to destroy sinful flesh in the flesh that you may no longer fulfill the righteousness of the law according to the flesh, but according to the Ruah or the faith in Yahuwah, therefore manifesting that in your behavior that the just will live by their faith. So since men are not doing this and they don't understand that and see that. See, we throw shalom around as just a regular phrase. We say it like it's a regular phrase, not really understanding the benefit of what's manifested in that particular word. And he say men are not manifesting that because if you say you got shalom, there ain't no sin in your mortal body. You're not going to be able to do that. You're not going to have nefarious ulterior motives that make sucker moves. You're not going to be nefarious. You're not going to do any of that. Then he says long suffering. That's the same the one of the things we just mentioned. And we're going to sit back and look at that when we look at something that Job states. When someone does you wrong, that you can suffer their wrong like Yahuwah has suffered all wrongs. This is really dealing with, when you talk about manifesting good fruit, it's manifesting Yah. But a lot of people have an idea of who Yah is, and but they don't really. This is why the master said, Kadesh Father, they have not known thee. All them people walking around, when that man said that in the 17th chapter of John, they thought they knew Elohim. He says, he says you know, he is my Elohim. He said, who you say is your Elohim. You know what I'm saying? Everybody is saying Yah is their Elohim, but somebody is a liar, according to what Hamashiach said, because they don't know this man. He said, if I say I know him not, I'll be a liar like unto you. Everybody walking around here can't know him. Somebody lying. Somebody lying. I'm talking about according to what his book say, not my personal opinion. Somebody is lying, because the master said, Kadesh, Father, the world have not known thee. He said, but I have known thee, and these whom you gave me know you as well. He said, the world has known us not because it know him, know him not. Hello? Hello? Yeah. Shalom. There ain't no way in the world all these people know this man. If all these people know this man, somebody's lying. And it ain't y'all, because y'all said everybody don't know him. His son said everybody don't know him. So we have to consider that. Then he turns around and say gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and temperance. So how can you sit back and you say that you manifest in fruits there's no gentleness and there's no faith? Because a lot of people don't believe. There's a lot of lack of humility and there's a lot of people that are not executing self-control. You know the book says a man who has no control over his ruach is like a city with no walls. So this is what this man say when he say bringing forth good fruit. Because he said the law is just 
Kadesh and good and the commandment is it and the commandment is to believe on his son and the son was the manifestation of all of these things So if these people are not manifesting these things, then they ain't bringing forth no good fruit Come on back to Matthew chapter 7 and you can see how this man can be a trap He could be a trap even if you have heard of him he can still be a trap It's just not for those who rejected him. That's why I always been telling y'all for the longest Don't get amped up because you hearing about the man and then you don't actually believe the man and follow after the man It can be very well for your own destruction I know full well this man lets people come and hear of him so he can damn them because he knows they don't believe he said he already knew those who believe not. That's what he said in the sixth chapter of John. These people followed behind and heard everything he dropped. And he knew these people were going to hell. And he let them sit there and listen to it. Because that was his will. For that to be a trap unto them. 7 and 18. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that, tree that bring not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know that not everyone that saith unto me, Master, Master, shall enter into the kingdom of Shamahim. But he that do the will of my Abba, which is in Shamahim, many will say to me in that day, Master, Master, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Now remember, he said that which is for their welfare be a trap. That man said he prophesied in his name. So if they were prophesying in his name, they were preaching in his name. They were preaching in the name of Yahushua HaMashiach. They were saying that he is the son of Elohim and that he died and resurrected the third day. And he said they were casting out devils in his name. Matter of fact, what did it? Acts chapter 19. But he said, I don't know you. You are a worker of iniquity. That don't mean and You have to pay attention to that. They were doing all of these things to where outwardly people would look back and say, that's a righteous individual. But yet inwardly they were wicked and they were not entering into the kingdom. And this is how this man can be a trap. Your welfare can be a trap, a snare and a jeer. I mean, a, a snare and a gin, even though you're preaching of him. You're speaking of him. You're doing works in his name. No, we talk about that verse all the time because everybody knows those are the most terrible and terrifying words that any person who is a flesh and blood would ever want to hear in their existence. But do we really understand what he's telling us? That these were, and these were bruised. You know, we didn't mention these are bruised, you know, bruised like to say them Christians. No, them was Yahudim he was talking about. What this here, man? Acts chapter 19. I got to make sure I'm in the right place. I'm just trying to show you an example of what I'm talking about. <laughs> Acts 19 and 13. You already know what it is. Acts 19 and uh, 11, actually. It's just to sit back and understand that don't, it's basically for you not to rest on your laurels because you're hearing of Mashiach. I know I reiterate that quite regularly. Don't rest on your laurels. Hello? All right. And Elohim wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and diseases departed from them, and the evil ruachs went out of them. Then certain of the vagabond Yahudim exorcists took upon them to call over them which had evil ruachs in the name of the master Yahusha, saying, We adjure you by Yahusha, whom Paul preached. And there were seven sons of one skiver Yahudim, chief of the priest, which did so. Now remember, this is a chief priest. This is a chief priest. This is a chief priest now. Pay attention because this is exactly what the master was talking about in Matthew chapter 7. This is a chief priest. And look what happens. And the evil Ruach answered and said, Yahusha, I know. And Paul, I know. But who are ye? Now I'm going to ask y'all a question. Why would this demon, why would this evil spirit, why would this, 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 this wicked, vile creature, why would he know Paul? Why would he know Yahusha but not know Skeva? Who, who, why would anybody think Scripturally, why he wouldn't know him? Why would this demon be even able to open his mouth and say, "I don't know you"? What makes y'all think why he would be able to open his mouth and say that? Anybody got an idea? Don't everybody answer at the same time, though? Nobody got an idea why this why this evil spirit would sit back and say, "I know Yahusha and I know Paul." But who are you? Now, team. Probably want to live right. 
I mean, yes, pretty general answer, but could anybody answer that scripturally? Why this 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 evil spirit would not know him? Huh? I heard you will. Who would that behind? No, not necessarily. Let's look at John chapter 17. I he wasn't mentioned he, he wasn't chosen, but we had to sit back. And, before we look at John 17, because I'm going back with James chapter 2. I might not get to that Joel today. We're going in a little different direction than I intended. But praise your Lord either way. Uh, James chapter 2. Where is it at? I'm looking right. There we go. James 2 and about verse 17. It says, even so, faith, if it have not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I show thee my faith by my works. Thou believe that there is one Elohim, and thou do well. The devils also believe and tremble. Now, it says the devils also believe that there is one Elohim. Do y'all remember what the evil Ruach said of Hamashiach before he cast him in the swine? Do you remember what they said to him? Anybody know what they said to him? Yeah, I mean, they asked that, but what did they say before that? They said something to him. Let's look at it in Matthew chapter 8. Go ahead. Huh? Yeah, they knew who he was. Now, does anybody have an idea why they would know who he was? You got to also take into account, this evil Ruach knew who Paul was. So how does these evil Ruachs know who Paul... Because we could have the cop-out answer of, oh, you know, Hamashiach created them. He existed before all things, so that's how they knew him. But how did they know Paul, though? Because he said, I know Paul. Now, what? how did he know Paul? Don't worry, we finna look at it, y'all. He was doing with the goodness of Hamashiach. All right, there you go. What is that in? Rome, uh, Matthew 8, 28. This is what he say. He say, when he would come into the other side into the country of Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils, coming out of the tombs, exceeding fear, so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Yahushua, thou son of Elohim? Or thou come hither to torment us before the time. Now, you know, he told, uh, in another in another account, he told those, those evil spirits to be quiet. To don't make mention of who I am. Now Darius just mentioned to it, and I mentioned the verse beforehand in Psalms 139 and 16. My members were written in the book before they ever were. Well, we read that part in 2 Timothy 4 where Paul said that he was ready to be offered. His departure was at hand. You know, another place said he fought the good fight. Now a crown of righteousness is laid up to him because his name is written on high. Now, why is his name written on high? Because a book of remembrance was written before you and all those who feared him and thought upon his name. That means this man sat back. If you thought upon his name, that means this man's word is in your heart. And if his word is in your heart, you believe on Yahushua. And if you believe on Yahushua, your mortal body is dead because of sin, but alive unto righteousness. Therefore, you no longer let sin reign in your mortal bodies. And we know the law says sin is what caused a man's name to be blotted out in the book. So this chief priest giver, as Will had already stated, I just wanted scriptures for it. Clearly, his name is not written on high because his life and his faith don't line up with the book. Well, how could he be able to do to cast out demons in Yahushua's name? Because that man's name got power irregardless of the individual. And though he did that and he worked that miracle in his name, he still showed that y'all don't know you. Because they say the demons believe there's one Elohim and do tremble. And if the demons knew that Yahushua was the son of Elohim, and if the demons knew that Paul was a servant of Elohim, but he telling Skiva, I don't know you, that goes along with the master said when he said, yeah, you prophesied, you preached in my name. Yeah, you preached in my name. Yeah, you cast out unclean spirits in my name, just like Skiva did. Yeah, you did many wonderful works in my name. He said, but get away from me because I don't know you. You're lawless. 
You didn't come under my yoke of obedience. You didn't believe in me to follow me and to obey me. You didn't take up your stake and follow me. So all those things you did was to be seen of men. And therefore that which was going to be for your welfare ends up becoming for your destruction. It ends up being a trap. We don't sit back and realize that. Because John 17, let's look at that John 17. Let's look at what the master said in John 17. We praise y'all. I didn't intend to go this way, but uh, that's what it is. I might got time to swing this Joe Aiden head over. 17 and uh, 21, I suppose. That they all may be one as thou, Abba, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. The esteem which thou gave me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be perfect and one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Abba, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my esteem which thou hast given me, for thou loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Abba, the world have not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love where thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. So the, he said, I know the Father, and then the Son said, I declare the Father unto the, to the, to the, to the people, to the children. And train them in the way that they should go. That the love of you might be in them. Which goes to the key point of. We can't be loving in word and in deed. I mean in word and in tongue. It's got to be in actions and in faith. Your faith needs to be representative of the love that you have for you. Everything else going to fall into place. No matter what. See Paul told us the love of Mashiach. Let's go ahead and get that Roman chapter 8 real quick. Then we swing to Job 8. And then it makes sense. Because I can still work this Job 8. And 31 in here before I slide on out of the way because it's 833. 8 and 37. Well, 8 and 30. 35, I should say. Make it 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of Elohim's elect? It is Elohim that justify. Who is he that condemned? It is Mashiach that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of Elohim, who also make intercession for us. That goes back to what we looked in Psalm 69 with him hearing in the truth of thy salvation. And the faith of Yahusha he will hear, which lines up with what we looked at in 1 John chapter 3. That if you keep that commandment and you believe on him, and your heart does not condemn you, but is sure before him because you're loving this man in deed and in truth. Therefore, your cries can be accepted. He said, who shall separate us from the love of Mashiach? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? It's funny how so many different things come in people's lives and separates them from the love of Mashiach. See, the love of Elohim has to come before you can love a human being, a son of Adam. The love of, uh, of Elohim has to come first. Because if you cannot love, that's why he says the love of Mashiach. Not the love of your brother, but what will separate you from the love of Mashiach. Because clearly the love for your brother will be separated when the stress comes. Just like the man said in Matthew 24. You're going to clearly be separated because you're going to seek to save yourself. Because self-preservation going to kick in. Because he said a man wouldn't dare die for a righteous man per any man. Because it's not very many people going to lay down their life for anybody. Especially when trouble comes, their natural inclination is going to be to save themselves. So it's funny how when a little trouble, a little stress, this stuff causes people to commit sin. This is one of the reasons why this man tell you not to fool with sinners, nor be around sinners, nor make league with sinners. Because when that trouble and the stress come, they will seek to satisfy themselves by their idol gods or by their flesh. They have no one for them to love that would hold them back because they know that he did the same thing in the face of the same level of adversity. How can you get comfort in adversity from transgressors? That's impossible. I'm talking about the comfort that comes from Elohim. You look at when the master was in the face of adversity, who was he with? He was with his apostles. He sent a Malachim to give him strength. Knowing that Revelation 22 said that Malachim said, I am a prophet as you are and one of your brethren. This is why he said, I'm a companion of those that fear thee. This is why Jonathan came to strengthen David. 
You okay. can't get the strength and comfort from people who are not walking in what you're walking in in times of distress or anguish or persecution or tribulation. All you're going to seek to do is comfort your flesh because that's all they know how to seek to do. You have to understand that and know that. That's not knocks on people. That's reality. If people lean to their flesh, they're going to comfort themselves by their flesh. That's all they're going to know how to do. And that's all they're going to be able to present to you. They can't present to you anything else. Because they don't know anything else. Prayerfully, maybe if you who has not granted them the opportunity to learn of him, that he'll grant them the opportunity to learn of him, that their souls might be saved and they might be re re uh, recovered from the snare of the adversary. Nevertheless, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor malachim, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of Elohim, which is in Yahusha HaMashiach, our master. And we have to remember that. You have to keep that in mind. Nothing, 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 nothing should separate you from the love of your power. Nothing. That should not happen. Now, let's swing over here to uh, Job 8. Let me see if I can work this Job 8 in here. Or do I need to wait? I think I probably need to wait. I think I probably need to wait. Yeah, I'm probably going to wait on that one. You go to Job 31, though. And we're just going to look at son as fourth is Job speaking of long suffering. This is Job speaking in, in the 31st chapter of Job. But we're going to swing our way down to uh, by verse 26, I want to say. And I'm going to get ready to let y'all slide on out of the way. And most high willing Rick. Job 31 and by 26. So just a synopsis you know we're looking at we started off by looking at not to hearken to dreamers he say not to be careful that you be not deceived because many false prophets going to go out deceiving and then we looked at how he told you in Jeremiah that not to hearken unto the prophets they prophesy falsely and then he told you not to hearken to the dreams that you cause yourself to dream and that's what we looked at just briefly about the people heaping to themselves, teachers having itching ears. Why do the people have itching ears? Because of the dreams or the thoughts that they have in their own mind and own heart that they want to seek to hearken unto. So we have to be careful of that because we know the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And it can drag you off to go in a way that is not good, but after your own thoughts. Because you know a lot of times we had dreams and the first thing you want to have people assume with a dream is that it come from Yah. Every dream you have don't come from y'all. Just, just be honest with it. We read some of this stuff like with Joseph's dream and Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and we automatically assume I want to know somebody who can interpret dreams because we think it be from the Most High. And sometimes your dreams are just things of your subconscious thoughts, the things that you've been meditating on, and it just manifests itself in that in that fashion. Every dream you have ain't a y'all. Some stuff is just your own subconscious. Things that you may have latently underneath that may deal with you or things that you've been able to perceive subconsciously that you didn't even realize on a conscious level and then it come to you when you're dreaming and then you see the manifestation of what you dreamed and you thinking well oh man that was uh that was, that was from y'all that was from y'all when really it was just your subconscious like i had a dream of what it looked like when the master came back that don't mean y'all gave me that dream that could have been a manifestation of how much book i was reading at the time that it manifested in my heart and mind and i seen it as it was written that don't mean he gave me that to see that don't mean that that don't mean that niggas have dreams and swear up and down y'all gave him that dream y'all may have not gave you that dream that might just be your imagination that could be your subconscious Cause I'm just sitting back thinking on something where somebody had a dream and it's very well that in their dream that is what occurred. It didn't occur how their dream went, but the instance of what was occurring in the dream more than likely occurred based on actions that we seen later. And that be your mind knowing, I know what's going down. And it just manifests itself while you're asleep. Because a lot of things be in our subconscious that we don't know exist there. The things that we think on, the things that we catch that just don't come to the front of your brain. 
But when they come, you'll know, you'll know when you got a dream from y'all. Believe you me. There'll be no doubting. I'm going according to the text. I ain't saying I had one. I'm talking about you going to know. Because you better believe every time you seen somebody in this book had a dream and y'all came to him in that dream, they knew it. They knew it came from him. It wasn't no doubting or no wondering. They knew it. And you will know it. 31 and 26. If I beheld the sun when it shined or the moon walking in brightness and my heart had been secretly enticed or my mouth had kissed my hand, listen to him. This also were an iniquity to be punished by the judge for I should have denied the Elohim that is above. If I had rejoiced at the destruction of him that hated me or lifted up myself when evil found him, neither have I suffered my mouth to sin by wishing a curse to his soul. Now, this is what we're going to conclude with right here. This man said, if, there were an, if he rejoiced at the destruction, so we're going to look at those words briefly, and I'm going to try to speed it up because, you know, it's getting late. Now, remember, you know, Job's name means hated. So we know when he's sitting back and he's looking at rejoice, if you were glad at the destruction of him that hated you, and that word for destruction is simply paired, and that's ruin, disaster, or destruction of him that hated you. Now, Paul told you in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that he that despiseth, despiseth not man but Elohim, because he said he has given unto us his Ruach HaKadosh. That word for hated me here, of him that hated me, is, uh, if it wants to cooperate, is Sanaa, and that's just to be hateful, someone who hates you. Now, I want you to swing to Proverbs chapter 17. And about verse 5 and then we'll look at Proverbs 24 and then we'll try to sit back and think if we can think of examples of somebody who saw a destruction of their enemy did they rejoice because you know the people rejoiced when the master died and that ended up being a stain and a blot for them 17 and 5 Proverbs 17 and 5 listen to them Whoso mock the poor reproaches maker, and he that is glad at calamity shall not be unpunished. I'm, I'm going to give y'all an example of myself. This is what I perceived or what happened at a time. I was working for these people at, at, at cleaning this restaurant at one time. They had took over from my homeboy. And these people messed with me very, very much, very for no reason at that. You know, they had cut me and my homeboy time down, so they had done cut our cash a little bit. You know what I'm saying? And then his wife got stricken with a very, very debilitating injury. You know what I'm saying? Very, very bad. You know, and it caused us to be able to make more money. And I knew that this woman was my enemy, yet I did not rejoice at her downfall. You know, uh, matter of fact, I prayed for that lady that maybe he might remove his hand from her because she was bothering me unjustly. You know what I'm saying? She used to come tell me my husband take up for you. I don't know why he do it. It's that there and the third. And it was because of y'all. But once my time and my work was finished in that particular area, then we departed. Those people actually even jipped me and my homeboy out of money that they owed us. And not too long after that, they lost the whole contract for stealing. And we still did not rejoice at that calamity that befell them when it occurred. There was another instance of which I won't go into no great detail that an individual came at me without cause and the same type of thing is happening to him. And there was no rejoicing or happiness when that occurred because it's just sitting back looking at it's just sad. It's just sad because people know consciously what they're doing. But you have to know and understand and believe. That if you are a servant of Yahuwah and Ruach in the truth, he will render to your adversaries according to their works. The most thing you can say is what Zechariah said, man, may Yahuwah look upon it and requite it accordingly. If an individual is doing evil unto you, you know, he say it is a just thing for him to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. It's a just thing in the eyesight of your Elohim to pay back people who are troubling you. You just have to be patient. But when it comes, just like he said now, don't rejoice at those calamities. You will not go unpunished. See, those people sat back and they rejoiced at Amashia. See, this 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 verse is about Yahusha, whether you know it or not. Because they reproached the poor. They mocked the poor, let me let me say. Let me say that. That's what they did. When we look at that poor for poor, 
Is someone in want or hunger or impoverished itself or a needy man? This man was a rush. This man was in need of Yahuwah. And they mocked him. If you be the son of Elohim, come down from the state. They dishonored him, which we already read about that reproach and dishonor in Psalm 69. Because the reproaches of thee that reproached them fell on me. Because the scribes and the chief priests, they hated the poor and the humble and the needy man. And they persecuted him like they said in Ezekiel 22. And they spoke ill of him and they mocked him and they disrespected him and they killed him. And they're not going to go unpunished because they're reproaching Yahuwah. At the same token, they sat back and they were glad when this man died. They were glad when calamity fell upon him. And that man said he would not go unpunished. Matter of fact, let's look at that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 since I mentioned it. You have to learn to say, it's the same way where, where Micah said, my enemy shall be trodden down like mire in the street. You have to know and trust in the promises of Yahuwah that he renders to all those who love him. And that you have to trust and believe that he will do that in his time. And just like he said, you will see it. Maybe not in every instance, but most of the time, you're going to see it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 4. So that we ourselves esteem in you the houses of Elohim for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. See, that's an example of that. Hamashiach endured many tribulations. This is where the long suffering come in at. These people called him Beelzebub. These people tried to kill him on numerous occasions. They called him a blasphemer. They sought to kill him. They planned to kill him and killed him and he patiently endured all that trouble and we have to patiently endure all that trouble all the persecution all the evil speaking all these things that people do you have to take that because wait till it get real wait till it get real if you can endure it on the spot remember he said he that is faithful in least is faithful in much if you can do a small amount of persecution if you can endure a small amount of affliction if you can endure a small amount of tribulation then you can endure a lot you can endure a lot He said, uh, so which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of Elohim, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of Elohim, for which ye also suffer. Remember, we through much tribulation must enter into the kingdom of Elohim. It is the token of the righteous judgment of Elohim that you suffer these things. Because thou not Mashiach offer suffer to enter into his esteem. It was the token of the righteous judgment of Elohim for this man to suffer. This is why Peter them got up and rejoiced when they were stoned because they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name but men seek not to suffer that because they count the righteous judgment of Elohim to be incorrect and that's because the Torah is slack and wrong judgment proceed seeing is a righteous thing with Elohim to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you and to you who are troubled rest with us when the master Yahusha shall be revealed from Shamahim with his mighty Malachim and flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not Elohim and that obey not the gospel of our master Yahusha HaMashiach who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the master and from the esteem of his power when he shall come to be esteemed in his Kadeshim and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our Elohim count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of our master Yahushua HaMashiach may be esteemed in you and ye in him according to the favor of our Elohim and the master Yahushua HaMashiach. I hope that Elohim count any of you worthy for that calling to suffer shame and tribulation for his name. And I pray you have the strength to endure it. I pray for you always. Some, most of y'all shoot pretty much all y'all three times a day. Bare minimum. Some of y'all more than that. Do you know what I'm saying? So, you got to understand that that's a blessed thing to take it. Blessed thing to take it. It is what it is. That is an evidence of the righteous, the token of the righteous judgment of Elohim. No, we just had a conversation with a brother about this. And it's a hard saying. And, you know, we deal with it a lot. But I've been telling y'all this mostly since I've known y'all. Most of y'all. And y'all know that I reference Genesis 3 and 15 to y'all on a regular basis. Because there's enmity between the serpent seed and the woman seed. Everybody, and, right, and understandably so, wants Yashara to unify as a whole. I can dig that. But I know the book. And it's not going to happen. 
And most I will, and I have not forgot because that is on the request playlist as well. And we started it just a tad bit when we were looking at that first King chapter 12. And you who are willing, we're going to get to it because it's a long process and I need to take a whole week to do it. The parallels of the division of the kingdoms of Yasharal and Yehuda, showing that there has never been complete unity in Yasharal except for two times. And even then it wasn't complete unity to a certain extent because Adonai was trying to take the throne from Solomon at that time. And that's the simple fact of maybe a little bit under David and maybe a little bit under Solomon. But after that, this people ain't never been unified. Never. Because righteousness and unrighteousness, light and darkness, Kadesh and unkadesh, godliness and ungodliness cannot meet together nor agree, never has, never will be, and it's not going to happen. And if we think that this people is going to come together in one, we are on some high level narcotics. The only people who are going to come together in one are those who were ordained in Yahusha HaMashiach from the foundation of the world. And if they were not ordained by Yahusha HaMashiach from the foundation of the world, then they will not come together in unity into that perfect man and the fullness and stature of the faith. It's not going to happen. And when we speak like this and when we talk like this and when we manifest this out of scriptures, this causes many men to be angry. But the word says what it says. Take it up with y'all. Proverbs 24. It's almost 9 o'clock and I got to let y'all go. Proverbs 8. This ain't going to get into play. Proverbs 24. Verse 15. I want to say. No, nah, that ain't it. That ain't it. That ain't it. That ain't it. That is not it. That's not what I want Seventeen and eighteen. Seventeen. Proverbs twenty-four and seventeen. Seventeen and eighteen. Maybe nineteen. No, nah, I didn't want to go that far down. It says, Rejoice not when thy enemy fall, let not thy heart be glad when he stumble. Lest Yahuwah see it and it displease him, and he turn away his wrath from him. Now most high willing will continue this in on uh, on the on the Shabbat, but as you sit back and you look at this verse thirty, where he say he have ever suffered his mouth to sin by wishing a curse to his enemy's soul, I want you to come to Romans twelve and fourteen, and then and James chapter three, and we'll stop in James chapter three. Now we'll deal with that when you sit back and you we're going to look at an example of that is David saw Saul stumble, he didn't rejoice at it. He was not happy about it. Matter of fact, when that man came to bring him the tidings that Saul was dead, thinking that would please him, he killed that man. When your enemies, when your foes, when your adversaries stumble, you ought not rejoice. Because it will displease y'all. Because it's just a token of his righteous judgment. You should already know that he's going to render that. But before we, before we, after we read Romans 12, we're going to read Matthew 5 and then John, John, James chapter 3. Romans 12, what is it? Verse 14. This is what he tell you, right? Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Now, uh, an example of that is, is David with Shemai and Samuel. When he called him a bloody man and he cursed him. And Joab said, let me take his head off. And he said, no, nah, man, let him curse. He said, maybe Yah has bid him to curse and that curse will turn into a blessing. See, David didn't sit back and look at the person who was persecuting him. And because he cursed him and threatened him, he didn't threaten back and he didn't curse back. He didn't do that. This is where Hamasha get the principle from. So you have to understand that. That when somebody does that to you, you don't return that back. Because you don't even know that their curse or their persecution may turn into a blessing for you. And you turn around rejecting the blessing because you let your pride get in the way. Because you feel the need that you got to fight and defend yourself and say something back. You're not going to talk to me like that. You're not going to do me like that. No, that's not how that works. Let them go ahead and do. They heaping coals of fire on their head. Let them heap them. That man say they thirsty. Give them something to drink if they hungry. Give them bread to eat. We done dealt with that before. Do justly by them. Overcome evil with good. Heap the coals of fire on their head. You just read. You just heard that in Thessalonians. Heap the coals of fire on their head. Help them go to hell. Be a conduit and an assistant in them burning forever. By doing good unto him like the book say. What we at? Where we at? Matthew 5. Verse 43. 
You have heard that it's been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies and bless them that curse you, and do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be the children of your Abba which is in Shamahim, for he make his son to rise on the evil and on the good and send rain on the just and the unjust. That is long suffering, my people. That's long suffering. That's suffering injury with patience. Knowing that that patience of which you suffered as we just seen in Thessalonians will call this man to render judgment upon their head because it's a token of the righteous judgment of Elohim towards you that you suffer those things. James chapter 3. Remember that man said in Job, right? He said, if I curse my enemy, I bring a curse on my own soul. I sin against my own soul. I'm going to read that again so it can sink into your brain. He says, neither have I suffered my mouth to sin by wishing a curse to his soul. So you ain't got no business cursing nobody's soul because now you done caused your mouth to sin. Hold on, hold on. Proverbs 31. If it ain't 31, it's 30. I didn't want y'all to catch that real fast. Son in Proverbs when it comes to that. Praise y'all for the word and for understanding. Because I want your soul to be complete so you can be saved. Screw this other stuff people got going on. Make sure we got the right place. Proverbs 30 and 32. He said, If thou hast done foolishly in lifting up thyself, or if thou hast thought evil, lay thy hand upon thy mouth. Just because somebody done came at you with evil and you think of evil and you think you're going to open your mouth and do that there, shut your mouth. Close your mouth. James chapter 3, verse 13. My apologies. James chapter 3. And verse 1. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If, a many, if, if any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold, also the ships, which though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a very small helm, whithsoever the governor list. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindle. And the tongue is as a fire, a world of iniquity. So the tongue, so is the tongue among our members that it defile the whole body and set on fire the course of nature and is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and have been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is unruly, evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we Elohim, even the Abba. And therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of Elohim. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either vine, figs? So can no fountain both yield salt, water, and fresh. So keep that in your mind and understand that, that, that when somebody's cursing you or threatening you or persecuting you, he say, I haven't uttered no curse to their soul through my mouth, therefore sinning with my mouth. Because that's not just before Elohim. That's not right before Elohim. And we should not carry nor conduct ourselves in that fashion. But I say hallelujah for Yahushua and the word. We'll cease and desist right there.